Chapter 12, Through the Stable Door. Jill ought to have been back at the White Rock already, but she had quite forgotten that part of her orders in the excitement of watching the fight. Well, now she remembered. She turned at once and ran to it, and arrived there barely a second before the others. It this happened that all of them, for a moment, had their backs to the enemy. They all wheeled round the moment they'd reached it. A terrible sight met their eyes. A Kalermine was running towards a stable door, carrying something that kicked and struggled. As he came between them and the fire, they could see clearly both the shape of the man and the shape of what he carried. It was Eustace. Tyrion and the unicorn rushed out to rescue him, but the Kalermine was now far nearer to the door than they. Before they had covered half the distance, he had flung Eustace in and shut the door behind him. Half a dozen more Kalermines had run up behind him. They formed a line on the open space before the stable. There was no getting at it now. Even then, Jill remembered to keep her face turned aside well away from her bow. Even if I can't stop blubbing, I won't get my string wet, she said. Wear arrows, said Poggin suddenly. Everyone ducked and pulled his helmet well over his nose. The dogs crouched behind, but... Though few arrows came their way, it soon became clear they were not being shot at. Griffel and his dwarfs were at their archery again. This time, they were coolly shooting at the Kalermines. Keep it up, boys, came Griffel's voice. All together, carefully. We don't want them any more than the monkeys or lions or kings. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs. Whatever else you may say about dwarfs, no one can say they aren't brave. They could have easily gotten away to some safe place. They preferred to stay and kill as many of both sides as they could, except when both sides were kind enough to save them trouble by killing one another. They wanted Narnia for their own. What perhaps they had not taken into account was the Kalermines were mail-clad, and the horses had no protection. Also, the Kalermines had a leader. Rishda Tarkhan's voice cried out, Thirty of you keep watch by those fools of the White Rocks, the rest! After me, and we shall teach these sons of Earth a lesson. Tyrion and his friends, still panting from their fight and thankful for a few minutes' rest, stood and looked on while the Tarkhan led his men against the dwarves. It was a strange scene by now. The fire had sunk lower. The light it gave now was less and of a darker red. As far as one could see, the whole place of assembly was now empty except for the dwarves and the Kalermines. In that light, one couldn't make out much of what was happening. It sounded as if the dwarfs were putting up a good fight. Tyrion could hear Griffel using dreadful language, and every now and again the Tarkon calling, TAKE ALL YOU CAN ALIVE! TAKE THEM ALIVE! Whatever that fight may have been like, it did not last long. The noise of it died away. Then Jill saw the Tarkon coming back to the stable. Eleven men followed him, dragging eleven bound dwarves. Whether the others had all been killed, or whether some of them got away, was never known. Throw them into the Shrine of Tash, said Rishta Tarkhan. And when the eleven dwarves, one after the other, had been flung or kicked into that dark doorway, and the door had been shut again, he bowed low to the stable and say, These are also thy burnt offering, Lord Tash. And all the Kalermines banged the flats of their swords on their shields and shouted, Tash! Tash! The great god Tash! Inexorable Tash! There was no nonsense about Tashlan now. The little party by the White Rock watched these doings and whispered to one another. They found a trickle of water coming down the rock and it all drunk eagerly. Jill and Poggin and the king in their hands, while the four-footed ones lapped up from the little pool which it had made at the foot of the stone. Such was their thirst that it seemed the most delicious drink they'd ever had in their lives. And while they were drinking, they were perfectly happy, could think of nothing else. I feel it in my bones, said Poggin, that we shall all, one by one, pass through that dark door before morning. I can think of a hundred deaths I would have rather died. It is indeed a grim door, said Caspian. It is more like a mouth. Oh, can't we do anything to stop it, said Jill in a shaken voice. Nay, fair friend, said Jewel, nosing her gently. It may be for us 
the door to Aslan's country, we shall sup at his table tonight. Rishta Tarkhan turned his back to the stable and walked slowly to a place in front of the white rock. Harken, he said. If the boar and the dog and the unicorn will come over to me and put themselves in my mercy, their lives shall be spared. The boar shall go to a cage in the Tisrock's garden, the dogs to the Tisrock's kennels, and the unicorn, when I have sawn his horn off, shall draw a cart. But the eagle, the children, and he who was king shall be offered a tash this night. The only answer was growls. Get on, warriors, said the Tarkon. Kill the beasts, but take the two-legged ones alive. And then began the last battle of the last king of Narnia. What made it hopeless, even apart from the numbers of the enemy, was the spears. The Kalermines, who had been with the ape almost from the beginning, had no spears. That was because they had come into Narnia by ones and twos, pretending to be peaceful merchants. And of course, they'd carried no spears, for a spear is not a thing you can hide. The new ones must have come in later, after the ape was already strong and they could march openly. The spears made all the difference. With a long spear, you can kill a boar before you are in reach of his tusks, and a unicorn before you are in reach of his horn, if you are very quick and keep your head. And now the leveled spears were closing in on Tyrion and his friends. Next minute, they were all fighting for their lives. In a way, it wasn't quite as bad as you might think. When you are using every muscle to the full, ducking under a spear point there, leaping over it there, lunging forward, drawing back, wheeling round, you haven't much time to feel either frightened or sad. Tyrion knew he could do nothing for the others now. They were all doomed together. He vaguely saw the boar go down on one side of him, and Jewel fighting furiously on the other. Out of the corner of one eye, he saw only one, a big Kalermine, pulling Jill away somewhere by the hair. But he hardly thought about any of those things. His only thought now was to sell his life as dearly as he could. The worst of it was he couldn't keep to the position in which he had started under the White Rock, a man who is fighting a dozen enemies at once may take his chances wherever he can. He must dart wherever he sees an enemy's breast or neck unguarded. In a very few strokes, this may get you quite a distance from the spot you began. Tyrion soon found he was getting further and further to the right, nearer and nearer to the stable. He had a vague idea in his mind that there was some good reason for keeping away from it, but he couldn't now remember what it was. And anyway, he couldn't help it. All at once, everything came quite clear. He found he was fighting the Tarkhan himself. The bonfire, or what was left of it, was straight in front. He was, in fact, fighting in the very doorway of the stable, for it had been opened, and two Kalermines were holding the door, ready to slam it shut the moment he was inside. He remembered everything now, and realized the enemy had been edging him to the stable on purpose ever since the fight began. And while he was thinking this, he was still fighting the Tarkon as hard as he could. A new idea came into Tyrion's head. He dropped his sword, darted forward, and under the sweep of the Tarkon scimitar, seized his enemy by the belt with both hands, jumped back into the stable, shouting, Come in and meet Tash yourself! And there was a deafening noise. When the ape had been flung in, the earth shook, and there was a blinding light. The Kalerman soldiers outside screamed, Tash! Tash! and banged the door. If Tash wanted their own captain, Tash must have him. They, at any rate, did not want to meet Tash. For a moment or two, Tyrion did not know where he was, or even who he was. Then he steadied himself, blinked, and looked around. It was not dark inside the stable as he had expected. He was in strong light, and that was why he was blinking. He turned to look at Rishta Tarkon, but Rishta was not looking at him. Rishta gave a great wail and pointed that he put his hands before his face and fell flat, face downward on the ground. Tyrion looked in the direction where the Tarkon had pointed, and then he understood. A terrible figure was coming toward them. It was far smaller than the shape they had seen from the tower, though still much bigger than a man. And it was the same. 
It had a vulture's head and four arms. Its beak was open and its eyes blazed. A croaking voice came from its beak. Thou hast called me into Narnia, Rishta, Tarkan. Here I am. What hast thou to say? Tarkhan neither lifted his face from the ground nor said a word. He was shaking like a man with a bad hiccup. He was brave enough in battle, but half his courage had left him earlier that night when he first began to suspect there might be a real Tash. The rest of it had left him now. With a sudden jerk, like a hen stooping to pick up a worm, Tash pounced on the, the miserable Rishta and tucked him under the upper of his two right arms. Then Tash turned his head sideways to fix Tyrion with one of his terrible eyes, for of course, having a bird's head, he couldn't look at you straight. But immediately from behind Tash, strong and calm as the summer sea, a voice said, Be gone, monster, and take your lawful prey to your own place. In the name of Aslan and Aslan's great father, the Emperor over the sea. The hideous creature vanished, with the Tarkhan still under his arm. And Tyrion turned to see who had spoken. And what he saw then set his heart beating as if it had never beaten in any fight. Seven kings and queens stood before him all with crowns on their heads and all in glittering clothes. But the kings wore fine mail as well as had their swords drawn in their hands. Tyrion bowed courteously and was about to speak when the younger, youngest of the queens laughed. He stared hard at her face and then gasped with amazement for he knew her. It was Jill. But not Jill as he had seen her last, with her face all dirt and tears and an old drill dress half slipping off one shoulder. Now she looked cool and fresh, as fresh as she had just come from bathing. And at first he thought she looked older, but then didn't. And he could never make up his mind on that point. And then he saw that the youngest of the kings was Eustace. But he was also changed as Jill was changed. Tyrion suddenly felt awkward about coming among these people with the blood and dust and sweat of battle still on him. The next moment he realized he was not in that state at all. He was fresh and cool and clean, and dressed in such clothes as he would have worn for a great feast at Caer Paravel. But in Narnia, your good clothes were never your most uncomfortable ones. They knew how to make things that felt beautiful as well as looking beautiful in Narnia. And there was no such thing as starch or flannel or elastic to be found from one end of the country to the other. Sire, said Jill, coming forward and making a beautiful curtsy, let me make known to you Peter, the high king over all kings in Narnia. Tyrion had no need to ask which was the high king, for he remembered his face, though here it was far nobler from his dream. He stepped forward, sank on one knee, and kissed Peter's hand. Hi, king, he said. You are welcome to me. And the king raised him and kissed him on both cheeks as a high king should. Then he led them to the eldest of queens, but even she was not old. And there were no gray hairs on her head and no wrinkles on her cheek and said, Sir, this is that Lady Polly who came into Narnia on the first day when Aslan made the trees grow and the beasts talk. He brought him to the next man, whose golden beard flowed over his breast and whose face was full of wisdom. And this, he said, is the Lord Diggory who was with her on that day, and this is my brother, King Edmund, and my sister, the Queen Lucy. Sir, said Tyrion, when he had greeted all of these, if I have read the chronicle right, there should be another. Has not your majesty two sisters? Where is Queen Susan? My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Yes, said Eustace. 
Whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, What wonderful memories you have. Fancy you still thinking about all those funny games you used to play when we were children. Oh, Susan, said Jill. She's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight too keen on being grown up. Grown up indeed, said the Lady Polly. I wish she would grow up. She wasted all her school time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Her, old, her whole idea is to race on to the silliest time of one's life as quick as she can, and then stop there as long as she can. Well, don't let's talk about that now, said Peter. Look, here are lovely fruit trees. Let us taste them. And then for a time, Tyrion looked about him and realized how very queer this adventure was. And that's the end of chapter 12. The last battle of the last king of Narnia is now complete. And King Tyrion, that last king, now finds himself face to face with the great lords and ladies he has only heard of, dreamed of, or met in that shadowy vision at the beginning of our book. All the friends of Narnia gathered back once again, from our first book to our last, throughout each of the adventures, all of these Human friends, the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, now gathered in this beautiful place. There is so more, much more to be said in the next few chapters. So let me just leave this beautiful moment with these words. In beauty, joy, and in peace, they are all gathered despite everything else that has happened. And we must know that this is the very hand of Aslan. The caution and concern, then, involves the one friend of Narnia not there, Susan, who has become so preoccupied with the particular pleasures of the world as maybe only a young woman at her age of life could be quite so consumed. And all the adventures she once shared in, now seen as just childhood memories and games. And there is a deep, deep regret that someone who has known so intimately, so powerfully the truth of Narnia, of Aslan, and even of one another, would allow anything else, but certainly nothing quite so frivolous to get in the way. May our faith, what we know, what we've lived, and we absolutely believe to be true, and never let it get choked out by the wares and the hows of daily life. The things that might seem so important today, they will come and go, always, always hold firm and hold fast the things that shall endure forever. Never let it be said that each of us is never a friend of Narnia, always.